Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to be able to speak to you, to you all. And thank you to the European, the Environment Protection Agency and the Health Services Executive in particular for, for thinking of us and for inviting us along. I was extremely interested as well to hear your perspectives on, on Healthy Ireland and the, the way that you have this national strategy which tries to look at different aspects of health in a, in a very joined up way. I think it's, it's, it's a very good example of uh, how government uh, departments can come together to, to put a focus on health. So we're really very pleased with that. Uh, I'm coming to speak to you at a very significant time, I think, um, for the European Union and by definition as well for its member states because um, we have uh, launched uh, in the last few months a, a reflection on the future of Europe which uh, really sets out in, in a number of papers which you've probably seen or you may have seen or may have heard of uh, a number of options for our future development at the European Union level uh, ranging from doing less, continuing uh, as we're doing at the moment or doing more? And this is a very political question uh, which is being discussed at the moment um, in all sorts of settings but also at the level of citizens. And when I saw that this conference was uh, devoted to increasing the participation of citizens in a discussion on environment and health, this is very much a topic which I think is related to what we're discussing at the European Union level. Uh, you, not without knowing as well that we're in the process of uh, one of our member states negotiating its departure from the European Union. This is uh, a traumatic exercise for, for both sides and I think will also have particular consequences on the island of Ireland. And um, this is being discussed as we speak. Um, I think it's also a time which has led to a, a certain reflection on the meaning of Europe and the future of Europe. That translates into practical um, implications uh, on the European Union level. And on the European Union level, I would mention in particular the multi-annual financial framework. Multi-annual financial framework, uh, the current one, ends in 2020. And we're in the process at the moment of drawing up our proposals for the new spending cycle for the European Union in all of our spending areas, whether that be in the regional funds, the structural funds, the agricultural policy, uh, the research programme and so on and so forth. So all of these programmes are being renegotiated as we speak. And I think it's really important that people are aware of this because uh, it's at the member state level, not only at the government level, but also at the level of citizens and concerned citizens that uh, these decisions will be taken for the next few years. We're in a tight budgetary situation at the moment. We're talking about a reduction in the European Union budget uh, given these different scenarios which we're working on, uh, which will mean that choices will have to be made between different programmes. So it's not business as usual. I think that was the main message I wanted to convey in my opening remarks. The second point I wanted to make is that there is very much a stress at the moment on the governance of the Eurozone. Ireland is a member of the Eurozone and has lived through a very difficult crisis period in the last few years. We're now looking into new methods of governance in the, in the Eurozone, which can also imply a more linked up and uh, joined up um, policy coordination across the member states. And why I say that here, you might say, well, why is he talking about money? Why is he talking about politics? Uh, well, environment and health are politics because I think there is a choice to be made between the type of development that you, you want in Europe. The type of development we want in Europe is not the type of development that you have in India or China. We don't want to be walking around with masks. We don't want to be walking around suffering from respiratory diseases because of environmental um, pollution. Uh, I think Europeans expect a certain quality of life. And therefore, uh, when we're making our choices on economic development, I think it's very important that people speak up and citizens speak up and make their politicians understand that uh, a certain quality of life is part of our way of life in Europe. So these were just some introductory remarks I wanted to make in order to say that we're not in a business-as-usual scenario. 
uh, things are changing and I think it's very important that people are alert and are watching the agenda and contribute to the agenda. But if I might turn back to the subject of my speech this morning, or my intervention this morning, I wanted to first of all say that in the European Union, everything we do uh, is supposed to have its roots in the treaty. We don't have a free choice of what we do in Europe. We have to depend on, on our legal basis. And in particular, um, we have an article in the European Union Treaty which uh, speaks about human health protection and says that human health protection shall be ensured uh, in the definition and implementation of all uh, union policies. So this is the, the sort of founding stone for, for what we do on public health in the European Union. Uh, the objectives of the European Union in terms of public health are also defined in the treaty and the intention is to improve public health, to prevent physical and mental uh, illness and diseases and to obviate uh, sources of danger to physical and mental health covering the major health scourges. And secondly, to pr promote research into the causes, transmission and prevention health information, early warning and combating of cross-border health threats. This includes, for example, what we heard about earlier, the example of antimicrobial resistance. And it's true to say that antimicrobial resistance, as the Chief Medical Officer from the UK pointed out, represents an enormous threat for our health systems and for our populations around Europe. And incidentally, it has a very strong uh, environmental uh, component which has been neglected. Uh, very much uh, until recently. The Commission has published a five-year action plan which takes a One Health approach, in other words looking at the agricultural aspects, the food production, animal husbandry aspects, but also the human health aspects and the research aspects, bringing that together with the pharmaceutical uh, research uh, agenda because as we all know it's not only a problem that, um, and that um, infections are becoming resistant, but it's also a problem that new antimicrobial agents are not coming on the market. There is an empty pipeline for new antimicrobial agents, and this is our biggest problem, that the business model for the industry to invest and produce new antimicrobial agents is just not there. Uh, so we have a major problem with antimicrobial resistance and we're trying to increase the awareness of this problem and to improve the stewardship of the few uh, functioning antibiotics which we still have. It's a major problem. Um, but I'm glad that, that this was brought up in the context of the conference. Now, how does the European Union act uh, in terms of uh, our activities on health? We have a number of financial uh, incentive measures, and I'd mentioned here in particular the health programme, but also we have the structural funds which can be mobilised for uh, structural changes which uh, affect health systems, for example, investments in hospitals or investment in primary care, um, uh, investments in training in universities, for example, to try and improve the quality of training of health professionals. We also have the regional funds. But we do have the possibility as well to adopt European level le legislation and here I'd mentioned the European legislation on uh, cross-border health threats on pharmaceuticals. You know that the uh, European Medicines Agency was recently moved from last week from London to Amsterdam. This is an example of a European agency which um, evaluates new products coming on the market and then these are authorised for sale across Europe. So the pharmaceutical legislation is a good example of where uh, the assessment and the authorization of products is entirely covered by European legislation. You also have legislation on blood, organs, tissues and cells, um, on veterinary and phytosanitary fields and on tobacco. The Irish are great experts on tobacco and particularly on tobacco control. Uh, and I pay tribute to my colleagues in the Department of Health for their leadership role in, in, your, in the world, I would say, in, in leading um, tobacco control. Ireland has really been a shining example of how to take public health measures which are effective. And of course we have also recent legislation on medical devices 
and on cross-border health, health services, which is also incidentally of great importance for Ireland in respect of the situation with the United Kingdom and the departure of the United Kingdom, which will lead to a very complicated scenario there. And of course, we have uh, different agencies which uh, support our activities. For example, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, our, our European Environment Agency, and I'm happy to see that they're represented here today, and also other agencies such as the Drugs and the Chemicals Agency, uh, which do a lot of risk assessment work, um, which is the basis for, for then risk management at the European Union level. But of course, we also have legislation in other fields which touches health. And I'd like to mention here in particular the health and safety at work legislation, which is one of the founding pillars of the European Union. The European Union started off by being a coal and steel community. And therefore, a lot of our legislation at the very beginning related to the quality and standards for um, managing uh, health and safety in the workplace. Another policy which is being reformed at the moment, in fact there's a paper has been published today on the uh, reform of the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, the future uh, priorities for the Common Agricultural Policy are not going to be those of the past. Uh, there will be a major change in the uh, Common Agricultural Policy and Commissioner Hogan, the Irish Commissioner, is responsible for that and he's published today a reflection paper on uh, how the uh, policy could be reformed. We have, for example, the school fruit and vegetable scheme, which also applies in Ireland. The wine sector, which has a major influence on, uh, on health, but also the sugar sector. These are three examples of where the common agricultural policy has, has an interaction clearly with, um, with, uh, with health, but also with the environment, I would say. You have the media directive, the audiovisual media services directive. If you can watch television coming from other member states, it's because this is managed through the, uh, the media directive, which sets the standards for, um, for certain types of um, television or computer IT uh, transfers of um, commercial material. And here, uh, we have uh, rules which are being developed on advertising uh, of foods rich in sugar, fat, salt and alcohol uh, to children and young people. So the European Union is also trying to ensure a high level of health protection in this context of cross-border uh, media uh, transfers. We have the whole uh, area of taxation. We heard about the Irish sugar tax, but this is something which is happening in several member states at the moment taxes on sugar and alcohol, on tobacco, on the duty-free allowances are being reviewed. All of these issues are very important. And speaking as a former re revenue official from next door in Dublin Castle, I can say that there is a very strong, um, there's a very strong competition between the, the interest of the Department of Finance to have more money and the interest of other departments to perhaps try and use taxation as a means of changing people's behaviour. You have all the environmental law at European Union level. I've mentioned in particular the water directive, the noise directives and the air quality directives. And finally, I've mentioned the chemicals uh, legislation. And of course, since we uh, have just approved lysophate yesterday, for another five years, I might as well mention the farm legislation on pesticides. So, um, what is the framework for all of this at the uh, European and international level? The Commission and the Member States have signed up to what we call the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we have published a white paper in 2016, in November, on um, how to reach Sustainable Development Goal number three, which talks about ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all ages initiatives on public health, on health systems and the environment. Uh, uh, all of these things are included in the achievement, our aims to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The aim, the target is to reduce by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment and to promote mental health and well-being. 
This is a, uh, an international process which is ongoing at the moment and which is supported by the Commission, uh, but also uh, our legislation. Um, it includes the integration of these sustainable development goals in our internal policies. And this is a big difference from the past with the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were really directed at everybody else except the European Union. The Sustainable Development Goals are also directed within the European Union. So that's the big difference between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. They have been integrated in our internal uh, reflections. And they have, there are three basic pillars which we're hoping to uh, employ here, uh, first of all, the social pillar, in other words, trying to improve education, reduce poverty, uh, these sorts of things, but also the environment, improving the environment, and thirdly, the economic governance of the European Union. We're producing regular reports and regular reflect. we have regular reflections with the Council of Ministers on how to uh, implement these goals in the short and in the longer term. Turning now more specifically to the environment area, I mentioned the Treaty on the European Union before, but we also have an article relating to the environment. And Article 191 of the Treaty talks about contributing to preserving, uh, protecting and improving the environment, protecting public health and combating climate change. So this is quite a specific uh, legal basis which has led to a large um, body of legislation starting in 2000, uh, 1976 in the area of air pollution where we have 30 legislative instruments, directives, decisions, uh, regulations on ambient air, on the quality of fuels, on automo automotive uh, exhausts and type approval, on greenhouse gases, on water for example. The seventh environment action program which guides uh, policy at EU level, has some key objectives on uh, respecting the planet's ecological lim limits and on healthy environments uh, using the circular economy and um, making sure that resources are used in a sustainable way. Uh, the European Environment Agency, uh, which I mentioned earlier, provides independent information on the environment for those in involved in developing adopting, implementing and evaluating environment policy and also for the general public. And we also have uh, an interesting uh, network which is the European Environment Information and Observation Network which has 33 member states and collects and produces assessments on a wide variety of topics related to the environment. The Commission last week published in fact 28 country profiles which for the first time look in detail at the health status of each of our member states. And this is an interesting point to what Laura said earlier on about linking data sets. I think we have so many reports floating around. It's very important that, that these data sets are linked and that we don't uh, look in silos at individual reports, but we try and uh, link uh, our data sets as far as possible. And this is something which really the Commission is very attentive to and trying to map the different data sources which we have to make sure that we're covering all aspects of the problem. In respect of uh, environment and health priorities, I'd just like to say that uh, my commissioner, uh, Commissioner Andrew Kaitis, has stressed the importance of keeping people in good health for uh, as long as possible as one of his priorities, uh, rather than always looking at the prevention side uh, the, the idea of well-being and people keep, keeping people in, in good health and in a productive capacity for as long as possible. I think this is very important considering the demographic challenges which Europe has. We're one of the uh, oldest uh, population, one of the oldest um, populations in, in, uh, of any continent in the world at the moment and our ageing populations are going to produce a huge burden on, on our societies in the coming years. Already this is starting. Uh, we heard earlier on about the active and healthy ageing initiatives in Ireland, but I mean this is something which really has to be scaled up, I think. Um, my commissioner has also stressed the importance of and the potential of prevention of non-communicable diseases and promotion of good health. Um, I wanted to mention here in particular the 
economic burden of healthcare costs, uh, non-communicable diseases represent 80% of uh, your healthcare system costs. And this is really enormous, an enormous burden which, taken together with an ageing population, is increasing the, the fiscal pressure on the uh, healthcare systems. But also the problems of actually managing this, and I'm sure the health services executive would be familiar with the problems of the health workforce. The fact that our health workforce is, is shrinking uh, means that we will have more and more difficulties in the future to actually manage the number of people who are falling sick with preventable diseases. Uh, health impacts concern individuals, uh, groups of the population. I wanted to mention here in particular the aspects of inequalities because uh, one of the striking points of the environment and health studies, I think, is the, um, the fact that from all of these studies comes out the, 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 the strong message that it's the weaker parts of the population who are the most affected by environmental stressors. It's not people who can afford to live in good places or in good housing conditions or uh, who are well educated as regards uh, their, environment, their environmental uh, protection. It's people who are really at the bottom of society. And this is really a factor, I think, in increasing inequalities in society rather than decreasing them. So we really need to be very careful, I think, in setting our policy objectives and in implementing them that we take this inequalities aspect into account. Secondly, as I mentioned, we have this problem of sustainability of our health systems with up to between 6 and 10 percent of GDP in our member states being spent on healthcare costs. This is completely unsustainable in the long term, particularly if, if this pressure continues. And thirdly, there's the aspect of the ageing population and keeping people in work for longer because um, one of the problems we have in Europe is actually having a trained stable, uh, productive workforce in a situation where people are suffering from chronic multi-comorbidities. Uh, co and uh, this is putting great pressure on the economics. And that's why I started my intervention by talking about economics, because I think there is a very close link between economic performance and, and good health. The environment and health priorities uh, follow the health in all policies approach. And uh, we can see here issues such as air quality, noise reduction, uh, water quality, uh, waste, uh, chemicals, healthy cities, which we heard about earlier on, but also the climate change challenge. And we, we've seen uh, all over Europe different implications of climate change and how this affects um, people's health. And this is also going to impact on the burden of disease uh, and, and the, the linkage between um, non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases as well, because, of course, of uh, vector-borne diseases uh, also uh, increasing with climate change. We've seen Lyme disease, for example, moving northwards. We've seen malaria in three parts of Rome, chikungunya arriving in uh, France and Italy this year. So. Um, it's non-communicable diseases principally, it's air quality, it's respiratory diseases, but it's also, uh, non it's also communicable diseases. And this is, 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 of course, very important to take account of. In respect of water, um, the uh, European water policy um, uh, is, 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 is a good example which I wanted to give to you here because it's also linked to um, how European Union legislation can really lead uh, to, to changes. And I think Ireland is a good example of where uh, European legislation and the implementation of European legislation has a direct impact on citizens' lives. I, I subscribe to the Irish Times and I'm frequently surprised by the, the fact that in certain parts of Ireland people are recommended to drink bottled water. It seems a bit extraordinary. Uh, in this day and age, um, but it, it also points to weaknesses in the, in the implementation of the legislation. So I think uh, the European legislation can be a, a, an aid as well to citizens and to populations in improving the quality of their, their water supply, and I just wanted to make that point here. Um, as regards the circular economy and waste, um, we have uh, had uh, 
proposal to increase the, the value of products, materials and resources for as long as possible. The idea of this was to try and make uh, our production more sustainable and to reduce food waste and plastics. Uh, we have a, an action plan which was adopted with four legislative proposals on the quality of the environment, on protecting public health. Um, and we've also set up a stakeholder platform with a network of networks uh, involving industry, of course, as well, because I think this is one of the, the, the key players. Uh, the uh, measures on food prevention are, are significant in terms of monitoring food waste. Uh, Eurostat is doing a lot of work on trying to measure uh, food waste, but also uh, guidelines to facilitate food donation. You know that when people are donating food, uh, they're very often stopped by doing so because of the deadlines for consumption which are uh, indicated on labels, so a certain amount of flexibility has to be introduced there. Uh, because products are still, uh, can still be consumed even after the end date indicated on the packaging. So we're trying to modify our legislation there in order to try and reduce the, the burden of waste. We talked earlier on about noise, and I think noise is a major factor which contributes to people's health, and therefore I wanted to mention it, the, the fact that we have legislation since 2002 on environmental noise, which uh, obliges the member states to, to measure and to identify noise levels, to provide information to the public, and to reduce environmental noise. This is extremely important because uh, children are the people who are most affected, and also people in the lower social, uh, 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 social domains are, are the most affected. And uh, as I said, the member states have an obligation to map to know, in other words, and to tell people uh, the noise levels to which they're um, uh, exposed. The European Environment Agency has done a lot of work on this and has identified a noise as a direct determinant of hypertension and, and cardiovascular risk, which is certainly not well known. It's not well known among health professionals and it's not well known among the public. So I think there's a lot of information, which, uh, information and awareness raising which needs to be done there. And not only through reports, but also through passing this information actively through to the citizens so that they're aware that it's not just a question of discomfort, it's a question of effects, direct effects on health. And of course, perhaps the most clear example of a direct effect on health is what we heard about earlier on from Laura, is the issue of air pollution and the number of deaths and impacts from uh, air pollution are quite significant in the European Union. You're talking about almost a half a million people directly affected from cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Uh, as I mentioned, this has its knock-on effects on healthcare costs and on lost working days. And of course, the disproportionate impact again on, on people at the bottom of the social pillar and also on children. And that's where I think legislation is extremely important and implementation of legislation is very important. And there is no, um, there is no buy off between implementing the legislation and having economic progress. You can have both uh, if it's done properly. It's not a question of using, um, uh, using renewable energy or using coal. It's a question of uh, making sure that the progress which we have in Europe is ecological and that we're respecting the environment, we're respecting then people's health and people's right to health. Health is a right which people have. Uh, and therefore, uh, the more information we can get to people on the effects of uh, environmental stresses on their health will really, I think, drive uh, citizens into demanding higher, higher levels of, of quality. And we were talking earlier on about cycling, but I mean, this is also um, renewable transport is also something which Europe has been trying to push such as uh, the implementation of electric cars, uh, urban access restriction systems, uh, greening spaces and pathways for cycling and collective transport. These are all things which Europe has been trying to invest in and promote over the last few years. You can see here on this slide the uh, uh, objectives which we have uh, in European Union legislation for different types of uh, pollutants, for sulfur dioxide, for ammonia, uh, for nitrogen oxides and for fine particulate ma matters. Uh, these are 
legislative objectives which are laid down at the European Union level. And I think uh, it's important that we realize that uh, this is um, a moving target. It's something which uh, every time we, we open a new scientific journal, we discover uh, new uh, impacts of uh, the environment on our health. So I think this is probably something which, uh, if I came back in a few years' time, would even be further reduced. Mentioning now the uh, urban agenda for healthy cities, um, the uh, fact that the majority of the population in Europe lives in cities or in large towns means that it's very important to devote attention to the urban agenda and to planning, urban planning, making sure the transport is easier, making sure that people have access to physical activity uh, without uh, disproportionate effort, making sure that there's public transport. Uh, and we have uh, been promoting, again, as part of a sustainable development agenda, uh, the development of policies within cities and within urban areas to make sure that air quality, inclusion, poverty are considered when uh, urban planning is being um, promoted. Um, and. Uh, this uh, ha has, uh, of course, something which uh, has a funding implication as well, because uh, cities are very often uh, <coughs> subjected to uh, very strong uh, financial constraints compared with the national level. So uh, it's, it's important that we, we try and identify funding, both at national and at European Union level, to try and support these developments. And that's why the European Union has specific programs uh, to uh, improve the quality of urban planning and the quality of urban transport in particular. Mentioning climate change, we talked about it earlier on. Uh, the uh, global climate change has significantly increased the uh, probability of various extreme weather and climate events in Europe. I mentioned earlier on the, uh, the fact that we had climate sensitive uh, diseases which even this year have shown their head in Europe uh, and which have not been seen before, such as multiple outbreaks of malaria, chikungunya, West Nile fever, and, and other diseases which are vector-borne diseases. Uh, zoonotic diseases, of course, are the origin of many human diseases, and these are strongly um, influenced by climate change. And I think this is only going to get worse in the future. The health wave effects in, in urban areas is really a major uh, challenge uh, when we see the number of elderly people in particular who are affected by uh, urban heat waves. Um, this, is, this is quite a concern, and not only in the southern member states, but also increasingly in uh, countries uh, like France, for example, where in Paris uh, they didn't have enough mortuaries to actually hold the uh, people who had died during the last uh, major heat wave in Paris, so that people were being stored in mobile refrigerators. So. This is, gives you an indication of the sort of surge that you can have uh, during these unexpected events. And I'm not saying that Ireland is going to be directly affected in the same way, but you'll have other types of effects which will, will be coming your way. And I think it's very important to plan to make sure that your health systems are prepared and resilient for these types of, of situations. Um, in the issue of um, the uh, work which we do, we have... Uh, been trying to improve our preparedness, uh, our surveillance, our monitoring, and our capacity to improve response to health emergencies across the European Union. We work very closely with the WHO, of course, but we've also launched uh, several initiatives, such as the, um, the European um, uh, Medical Corps, which uh, can be mobilized in case of emergencies, such as earthquakes or uh, tornadoes or other extreme weather events. And this brings together resources which exist at the national level and which can be mobilized then uh, in the case of a cross-border event to, to react uh, quickly. And the funding has been made available as well for these types of interventions. So the Commission is trying to help member states to increase awareness and preparedness and resilience for these types of events, also in the area of climate change. Uh, I 
want to close up by talking about uh, citizen power. I've been working in different areas of public health for, for a number of years. And one of the striking uh, points about public health is it's very often driven by those who are most concerned. It's very often driven by patients. And it's one of the problems, I think, of environment and health that uh, you don't have environment and health patients, if you like. You have, uh, it's something which affects the population as a whole. And uh, very often, as I said, it affects people who are at the lower end of our societies, the people who are most deprived in our societies, and therefore who are, have perhaps the least capacity to express themselves to policymakers. So I think it's very important that we try and uh, facilitate and what you were saying, Laura, earlier on about making information available to citizens in a usable way, I think is very important. Um, uh, when I was working, for example, on the, on the cancer file or on the uh, rare diseases file or on other uh, dossiers, uh, one of the striking things is how patients in different member states coming together, comparing their situations, can actually drive policy makers and, and raise awareness. And I think this is not uh, something which can be sorted out by people sitting in a ministry behind a desk. It's something where um, citizens can themselves uh, contribute to setting priorities and to driving an agenda. And that's why I mentioned at the very beginning this uh, discussion on the future of Europe, because I think um, the uh, future of Europe must include health. Health is a cornerstone for sustainable development. If we don't have health, we have nothing else. If you ask anybody in the street what's the most important thing for them, they will probably say either their kids or their health, or both. Um, so it, it really doesn't make sense to talk about development and to talk about the future of Europe if we, if we don't include health as one of our major development uh, goals. We have this in the treaty, as I mentioned, both in terms of human health protection but also environmental health protection. We have lots and lots of legislation. One of the challenges we have is implement implementing the legislation. I gave examples of the Irish water uh, legislation and how that's implemented, and I think there are lots of examples around the community of where our legislation is not properly applied. This is a member state responsibility. It's also the Commission's responsibility to push the member states to make sure that the legislation is adopted. And then engaging with local citizens and communities, I think, is extremely important and crucial for, for success. And I think there's, a, there's still a long way to, to go, even if we have done quite a lot in Europe. I think we shouldn't be satisfied with ourselves. We should try and look and see where the gaps are and try and identify areas for improvement. Thank you very much. <laughs>